exploring how many area townships. And through today's technology, I was able to identify the location of each one of these two houses. And uh, as a result, uh, I found out many interesting tidbits and stories, and primarily through oral conversation. And then we organized a tour and a taping of the Halloween schools on the grounds of Pine Hall through the help of uh, Corey Graham and Dan Callahan and Jeanette Halloran Nash. We had a wonderful uh, conversation. And if you have never been to the Halloween School Halls in Pine Hall, please take time to do so. It's a fantastic thing. It's, a, it's time work, so to speak. A couple of uh, many conversations, uh, but uh, I, which I had the opportunity to sit down and have a Two things stand out in my mind. One was Linda O'Connell, telling about a family member who uh, went to school with a baked potato in her pocket. The mother baked the potato, kept her hands warm on the way to school, and when they got to school, that was their life. Another thing that stood out in my mind was uh, Jeanette's uh, Allen Nash, who said that the Halloran School House, when she went there for a couple of years, two years, I believe, two years, it was so warm and cozy. And that has stood out in my mind, the person who went to Minneapolis Public School, and the one of the schoolhouse was just a, a fascinating institution. And, uh, a story we may much <laughs> from one schoolhouse to the other, one family member to the other, to attend it, but it's a rich history. Please take time after the uh, discussion of the presentation to uh, look at the photographs that I gathered and copied from various uh, places of former schoolhouse children and um, the township maps. We have a couple of the records over here on the table. The, the three green binder over here has the schoolhouses identified as well as the location of the photographs from the children at the school. So without ado, I'll turn this over to Dan Callahan, who so kindly and graciously accepted the invitation to be our presenter tonight. Thank you, Dennis. This is not <laughs> this is not about me, it's about us and our shared experiences. I'm going to briefly go into how it was for myself and what I gained by going to a one-room school. But keep in mind it's about us. A lot of us had parents, grandparents, we had no teachers that were relatives. I'm going to show you a little vignette to kind of introduce you to Giesenbrau and give thanks where we need to. I got to listen to the song and how we're going to feed it in. You all know this song. You probably drank beer to it, or maybe you fell in love to it. I don't know. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to Giesenbrau for our meeting to discuss and share our memories and experiences at country schools and one-room schools that some of us may have attended. Many thanks to Dennis Dvorak and Fred Simon for doing the coordination to make this informative and interesting meeting happen. Thanks to the New Prague Historical Society for all that they do to preserve our great heritage. I hear that my beer is of the most excellent quality, so have a brew or two and join us in the discussion. Say, have you heard of Edelweiss, the song? I know there are some talented musicians out there and why not use my name, Giesenbrau, to substitute in the place of Edelweiss? You know how the song goes. Giesenbrau, Giesenbrau. And then talk about my wunderbar beer and have them pour you a people. Thank you very much for listening. And that concludes our, pr no. Um, <laughs> You'll notice that, that the bricks didn't line up right. Uh, there, there's going to be other similar uh, videos later on during the program, but uh, this 
building is not talking out of the right side of its mouth, <laughs> nor does it have anything to do with its political leanings. It just kind of happened that way. Maybe there's too much beer inside, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, with that, we're gonna start this off. Many, many of you have had relatives that went to one-room schools. I'm not alone. Uh, many of you have had relatives that taught at schools, aunts, grandmothers, people like that, that you know of that did teach at these schools. These were simpler times. Around 1870, there were 80 schools in Lee Sur County, most of them rural. Most of us were farm kids. Most of the teachers grew up on a farm, so they understood us like no other. They knew how we thought, they knew how we worked, and they knew our parents maybe a little too well, because when it came to discipline, they knew what we were capable of doing and causing trouble. Um, when the schools first started, there was um, mostly made of logs. They were either in a log cabin some settlers took it upon themselves to teach in their own house because they had some knowledge. They want to pass it on to the kids, don't you know? So after that, you went on and they had parts of houses, stores, what have you, where they taught. Some of the first teachers were male, but then the Civil War came along and they were either conscripted, some of them came home, some of them did not. At that time, like during any war, the women kind of took over and started doing teacher duties. So that when these schools started to open up in the 1870s, it was about an 80-20 with women to men. And you can look back and say, oh, I know this one, I know that one. I'm gonna tell you a story about two women that I know of that taught at these schools later on. One of them was named was, uh, Rhett Sullivan. She was a very tiny little Irish gal from around Tyrone. She married Jerry Sullivan. She happens to be Patty Sullivan's grandmother. She taught at a school near Pioneer Power, and there were a lot of boys in the neighborhood. There were Hayden boys, two families of them. There were Myers. They were a kind of rambunctious bunch. And the story goes, and a lot of schools have their own personalities, Jerry Sullivan, who was a funeral director in Lee Center later on, hit himself in the coal stove. And when she opened it up, he jumped out. <laughs> and he scared the bejesus out of her. There are a lot of shenanigans going on in these schools. There really were. But later on, these young men, two of them ran a dealership in Lesseur. I think three of them were priests. One was an exec with Green Giant. One was almost the bishop if he didn't have diabetes. So they were all successful. And of course, Jerry, the funeral director. So a lot of people that went to these schools went on to other things. They didn't all stay on the farm. They moved, they went away, they came back. Some of them, a lot of the young men stayed there. They went to eighth grade usually back then. And some of them stayed on to farm and some of them went in town to the help out or work and support the farm. So that's kind of how that went. But again, everybody knew everybody else and what they were doing. Now, we're gonna move forward to uh, 1915. By then there was about 120 schools scattered throughout the township and the county. There were seven uh, schools in Derrynane. There was about nine in Lanesburg. And the whole uh, county had about, I don't know, 120, like I said. And they were about three miles apart, these schools. They served the local area because transportation was not like it is today. Kids walked, rode a horse, whatever, they got there. And mass transportation or motorized vehicles weren't really in the picture till about the late 1900s. Then they came in. Then things changed a little bit. So everybody went. 
Everybody grew up on the farm. They all had chores to do. And often when I talk about on the farm, everybody says, we must have grown up on the same farm because we all did the same things. We all went to the same schools. And like I mentioned, many of them had different personalities. There was a school they called the Sharkey School. There was another school uh, closer to Pioneer Power. There was one at Lexington across from the lake, uh, all over. St. Patrick had one here, there, hither and yon. There were schools everywhere you went. One article in a paper said, the teachers that year were as thick as grasshoppers because there were so many of them. And you could imagine there had to be at least 100 maybe more in, in the high schools and the higher places of learning. So that's it. I'll tell you another story about my grandmother who was a teacher. She taught at the Sharkey School. Her name was Regina Kelly. Unlike a lot of the women, she didn't come from a farm. She came from Curtin and Lace. Her father was a salesman. So she was at this school and I think she came in 1915 had two years of normal school and, and was a skilled musician. So her adjustment and her learning curve were probably a little bit different. Her children went, because they lived in Scott County then, her children went to a school called the McKinnis School. She didn't really like the teacher and she didn't like what they were doing to her kids. So she moved them to the Sharkey School. So that was an early phase of open enrollment. <laughs> she says, my kids aren't going up there that teacher you know so she moved him down there and like a lot of them she's a pretty strong lady uh, in the area here everybody knows Betty Stika she was a teacher uh, everybody knows these folks and who they were there's a couple of ladies from town I want to talk about uh, one they were cousins and they went to district 107 and they were Myrtle, Retka, Hunzel, and Audrey, Sullivan, Moxa. They were cousins. They're both nurses in town here and did their thing. The other two that probably went to St. Thomas were the Shaughnessy girls, and I call it the long and the short of it, Anna Mae Witt and Mary Urock. They both taught as well. So the point I'm making is many, many children went on to teach at that school or other schools. And at that time, they, they came to high school. I think Anna Mae Witt taught at the parochial school and uh, Betty Stika taught here as well. And she was certainly an icon out of Pioneer Power. It was the values that they gave us. I mentioned in there that discipline was swift, but it was right. There was no messing around. There was no going to the principal's office. It was handled right there. And your folks usually knew if you had a problem because they understood. I was one of these kids that you know, I was in trouble most of the time. I probably had a little ADD and uh, they might have put me on the spectrum someplace just to calm me down. As my parents spent the better time of 16 years trying to keep me quiet, they always said I had too much to say. Thank God they didn't succeed. So these things are all factored in. Our teacher was Mary Keel. She was from Cordoba, a single gal. She taught up north down here. And she was our teacher for quite a while. She was our teacher for six, eight, ten years. The one teacher I want to talk about that was there before her was called Fritz. Pianco. Now the Pianks settled in the area. Sure, this was founded by Irishmen and all that stuff. But the Polish, as my dad said, the Polanders came in with the next generation in the 1890s. And they had big families too. She was one of 10. The Retkas had a dozen. And by God, Ed Holler and he had damn near a dozen himself. So it was a blend and Frances went to school there. In 1930, she came and she taught. And she was getting 75 bucks a month. But their duties were also starting the fire. And that was in the contract. Some of it's on the table that I brought there. They had to start the fire. They had to do all sorts of things. 
And if it got too mechanical, they just called a neighbor if they didn't know how to do it themselves. But most of them did it themselves. They did a lot of work. So they, they not only nurtured you, they, they took care of you. Our daily experiences were, were varied, but the same. We played our usual games, pump, pump, pull away, tag, you know, musical chair, all that stuff. We had music. We also had some crafts we did, seasonal with the holidays. Everybody got involved. Everybody helped everybody else. Uh, it was pretty nice. My introduction to the school was when I was very young and none other than Margie Holler and took me under her wing and sat me down by her because they knew I was a, you know, well, not a bad kid, but I was one of them. So she sat me down and, and then I went to school, but that was designed to bring us in so that we understood the school and we weren't afraid of the teacher. So that's kind of how that all went. It was, uh, it was a wonderful time. They taught us patriotism, and they taught us a work ethic, and it was basically reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we had science and mathematics, of course, which is very important today. We were in a living lab because Denny's cows were pooping in the field right next to us. <laughs> there was an operating dairy farm just up the hill, and there was all kinds of flora and fauna in the woods. So me, I usually walked to school a different way. I'd go by Denny's Creek and get there. I might go through the cornfield, or I might take the lane up. And the lane, the culverts later on, I was stashing stuff when I was in high school. I won't get into that. <laughs> but I remember that well. I remember that well. So we had a good time. We knew each other. Now there were Towards the end, when I first got there, there was like a dozen kids. My brother was there, and my brother's class had like six. And, and some of them that were there, like I said, were Retkas, Korlaskis, Sullivans, Hollerin, lots of Hollerins, you know, in there. So we, we started with that amount, and I went there in 1953. But in 1953, there ended up being probably 11 schools with 250 students. We were on our way out. And six years later, they closed the school and consolidated it. Good evening and welcome. I am a one-room school that was located in section 16 of Dernane Township in northern Leeser County, Minnesota. The land that I was built on in 1886 was deeded to the school district 107. Edward and Elizabeth Holler owned the farm where I was located, so I was referred to as the Holler School. Many children were taught inside of me, and many teachers taught at this school and many other schools throughout the county. Children from the local area went to school here until 1959, when my district was closed and consolidated to New Prague and other towns nearby. After my precious children left, I was used as a 4-H meeting place and mostly just an empty building after that. I was moved to Pioneer Power Showgrounds in 1986. That makes me 125 years old now. I believe that this will be my new and permanent home. The Burns girls, Lonnie and Diane, are the caretakers and curators of this building that I occupy. They clean, do windows, and tidy up the grounds before the Pioneer Power Show. Please plan to visit and hear some of the stories and how these treasured learning places helped many children during a simpler time. Thank you. 
The school will come back towards the end and talk to you once more <laughs> and, uh, and give you a plea. <clears throat> let me see here. I guess I'm good now. I'll just let you look at the school while I'm talking. Um, so it, it, was, it was good. Every day, every morning, we went to get water. I wrote a little story about called Long Pale Water Haulers. And the boys would kind of argue who was going to haul the water. It was one of those longer milk pails, about three gallons. I called it the Long Pale Water Haulers. And Denny Hollerin would mark off whenever we went. And we got a nickel every time we did. If you were able to get in, you might get a buck. But then later I found out Denny was being subsidized for the water. But don't say anything. <laughs> but it, that's OK. That's what we did. Uh, our lunches, we brought our own lunches. We had milk that was uh, delivered. I think Jeanette rode in on the milk truck. But he stopped there first at Ed Hollerns and then came back. The whole thing is, what's not a bit of irony, but fact, that the last children that went there were also Edward Holleran, three generations later. There was only six of us. There's my sister Jan, Bob Holleran, who are now deceased. And there was me, the only one in my class. But I wasn't the only one that was in my class. Jeanette Nash was the only one in her class, her sister Joan. And my sister, little Judy, went there one year. I kind of forgot about her, but she, I did. I, I just didn't even know she was there. I was oblivious. But uh, yeah, she went too, and uh, that's how it ended up. The, the last few days were kind of sad, but that's the way it was. We, uh, we had a good time. We enjoyed it. This set the foundation for us to have a work ethic, to have a moral standard, to have some fiber inside, and to know how to learn. They really cared. Parents back then really cared about their education. It was uncluttered. There wasn't anything coming in. It was a simpler time. We didn't even get a television until I think I was third or fourth grade. And then we watched Disney and Walter Crankcase on the TV. There was only two or three channels. A lot of us didn't even have a phone. We didn't really have indoor plumbing because somebody says, well, how is that at school? Hell, that's the way it was at home, for God's sakes. <laughs> and the toilet paper they had, I must get into that, was kind of like thin wax paper. It, and you can imagine that. It, and it was government stuff that we've got it. So that's why we resorted to bringing Sears catalogs to school and the Sunday paper. And there was a plant that we used to get, fine. It, 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 it didn't cause us a rash that was kind of good to use as well. So, so we, all, we all went that and there was a boy and a girl outside and like I said, I had it at home. A lot of us didn't quite have central heat or indoor plumbing. I want to talk about two people that were really instrumental in helping the school out. One was Dennis E. Holleran and Gert. They were there. If we needed something spur of the moment, Denny was just up the road. And Gert would help too. The other two that I need to mention are Jim and Esther Keel. They were leaders in the 4-H. They were there all the time. They work with all the kids. So. One of the stories was they were going to do Dickens' Christmas Carol. I didn't know this at the time and probably learned it subliminally because a lot of times I fought what I was getting taught. But they came in and they taught us all about Dickens and how all that stuff fit. We all had a part. We kind of went from Thanksgiving all the way to Christmas. That's about all we did. I got to be Tiny Tim. Because I was small and shy, don't you know? <laughs> so so I, what we did was, I'll never forget it. I was laying on the bed. I forget, I, they only gave me one or two lines. And I looked up and the whole school was packed. And I could see one of our neighbors and fellow in the 4-H. I could see Denny Sharkey's face way off in the background. And I knew that was going to be all right. But the school was packed. 
And I think we had one or two performances. Yeah, we went on field trips and stuff like that, but not too much. We were isolated. A big thing for us was to go to Hans in Belle Plaine for our clothes in the fall. We got a flannel shirt, a pair of jeans, and a pair of work shoes, and a Sunday shoes. If our feet didn't grow, we didn't get them till next year. That's just kind of how it went. The work shoes we wore to school, they kind of frowned on those work shoes when we went to high school because they, they had picked up a little odor, but <laughs> con country school, it didn't really matter. And we were given those flannel shirts, there wasn't much Kleenex, so by the end of the week in the cold season, my sleeve was pretty stiff. <laughs> it's, just, it's just how it went. And, and, and a, a lot of the, especially the guys, that went through that understand that. They know, they know what it was like. So it was great, it was good. Uh, as far as the school goes at Pioneer Power, there were two uh, women in the area the uh, Korleskis, Phyllis and her sister Darlene, they actually came kind of with the school and they were the, the first two to kind of get people in. Their mother was a Sullivan up the road, if any of you knew Frances Sullivan, that, that was her, their mother was a sister of them. And uh, the other one I want to make mention of that was responsible for getting the school to pioneer power was Bill Thelman, the chairman. He was a younger man at the time, but he was one of the guys that was a, a driver behind that. It's, it's a very good school. It looks, looks good now. It's a, it's a shining example of how things were. I could go on for another half hour, but I don't want to bore you. So we're going to kind of close this up. I have one more video that I have to show you. And this one you're really going to like. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am 125 years old. Like many of you, I have moved down the timeline and weathered many storms and bad times. My goals were met and many students have went on to live successful lives and be patriotic citizens that have contributed to their community, state, and nation. As we all age, some of us, have needed repairs, and I am no exception. I could use new siding. A beautiful new door to welcome those interested in me would be nice. New windows would be good as well. Lastly, to rid me of wasps that have attacked Diane Burns from time to time. After all that, I could use some nice, beautiful accent plants that would make me more attractive as well. Now I know that Pioneer Power will help in this process, but if anyone wants to help things along and donate, you are welcome to do just that. If you want to help, contact either of the Burns girls, Tom Graham, or the current president of Pioneer Power, Bill Thelman. This is not like a Save the School project at all. It is to make me look nice and attractive and a place where people want to enter and learn more about a one-room school. Thank you and have a great day. We're going to have a thing about St. Thomas in May out of Pioneer Power. And anybody that's interested is invited to come. I am the St. Thomas Church, located in Lee Sur County, just north of St. Thomas Lake, or Marsh as it is today. I'm about halfway between Union Hill and Lesur, as the dove might fly. I'm in the middle of a large cemetery where many of my former parishioners and others have been laid to rest. Richard O'Connell, is the current groundskeeper and he keeps everything looking just fine. I was built in 1883 by Irish immigrants in this part of Minnesota. Mostly all of my parishioners were from the local farming area. Many, many baptisms, weddings, and funerals are performed 
within these walls for over more than 100 years. Just a reminder, there will be a meeting to discuss and share information about the St. Thomas area in mid-May of 2023. It will most likely be held at the Pioneer Power Showgrounds. This will be part of the New Prague Area Historical Society's effort to preserve all of our important heritage and share it with others. There will be more to follow as time gets nearer to that date. Thank you. See you then, and God bless. That pretty much concludes. Like I say, I could go on for another hour, and I don't want to bore you or anything. And you, as Mona would say, you can just get too much of Dan once in a while. Uh, so I would like to open this up, and Dennis can help, if to share your experiences, what you had. Uh, most of them are good because it was a good time. Uh, it was an innocent time. And uh, like I said, the, the big thing for us is maybe we got to go to the state fair once. County fair was a big deal. All these things were big deals for us. So I even used that school to study when I got my new job in Farmington. I'd go down there and sit and think and remember this, remember that, go to the blackboard, and I'm sure others did that as well. So thank you for your time. I certainly appreciate being here, and I'm honored that the Historical Society wanted me to do this. I've, I've done this a couple places, but some of them weren't here. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for keeping it quiet. <laughs>
to school with. The Hollis, like, Hollis District 97 a week ago. And he is a graduate of, were you in Dairy Inn at the township? No, no, Sharon. Oh, Sharon. No, well, sure. Well, I know I have your, I have your lunch bucket over here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, it's been wonderful to be here tonight and, and hear a good presentation again. I attended district number 21 in Sharon Township. Uh, beginning in 1931, I was alone in my grade for eight years until 1939. It was a disaster. I never learned to study because I was never competed with. Everything I said, I was the smartest and the dumbest. <laughs> I know the feeling. Choice. But, uh, it was an outstanding school. We carried a bucket of water from Nelson to our boat. <laughs> we came to the two little edifices that were behind the school. One was for girls and one was for men. And uh, I uh, then went to Lasora High School and graduated. And we didn't have any. Uh, 43, but will be 80 years this spring. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> little sandwiches with some uh, jam in it, gooseberry jam. And I had I got stand in the cow pasture so she could make jam. And this is a half gallon molasses pail from Beater Brothers in Belle Plaine. And that was my lunch bucket. This is the actual one. I had a picture in the library, oh here, of my brother and I, Kenneth, who was a uh, three years older than me, we're ready to leave to walk the mile, uphill both ways, <laughs> and the mile back. So, so thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Hollis. <laughs> See, we all went to the same school. Yeah, now, you don't have to be 97 like Hollis to have experienced a one-room schoolhouse. By the way, $65 was the right amount. My father was a clerk, and Roy Rethel down the street, was down the lane, was a treasurer. So dad would write the check. I'd take it to Roy Rethel, the treasurer. He would sign it, and then I would take it to the teacher and hand it to her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Hollis. Now, Mike, Dr. Mike Wilcox is not here this evening, and um, but he conveyed the story through his wife Kay that he attended a one-room schoolhouse, and he did kind of something interesting every day. He brought what did he bring to school with him every day? Dog Buster, who sat in the cloakroom. Yeah. Uh, can you envision that? It's a Norman Rockwell image. <laughs> it is a Norman Rockwell image. Buster came to school. The teacher allowed him to take that. You know. now, that, that George Wynn attended a one-room school. Eight years. I, only kid in the class. Yep. What did you read the class valedictorian too? And the dunce. What did you <laughs> both, both. What, you told me something that you learned in sixth grade. Did you tell everybody? Oh, our, our teacher. You know, at that country school, there, when, we, when I started, I went, they busted me over to another school. I was the only kid in the whole district, and then next year he started with 10 kids. But um, our teacher taught us music and art, and we had, in our church, or in our, in our uh, school, we had Baptist, Lutheran, Catholic, and I forget, there was a couple of nothings too, probably. But she prayed every day. At noon, she prayed, and we, that's what we did, and we sang religious songs for Christmas and all that kind of stuff. But anyhow, she was taking her course in math, and I think she taught me uh, or, uh, algebra in my fifth grade. And I was like, in math in college. But that was a good start. I mean, and we used to listen to KUOM, because I, I started school, I'm 85, so you can tell I was a long time. And the other good thing was neighbor, that lived by us was Elvin Gates, who was a bachelor, and he fed his cattle with bobsled. And so we had to walk three quarters of a mile to school. 
So he'd see us kids walking in the winter, he'd swing out with that, and we'd all stand on the runners, you know, these bobsleds, so they dangerous as all heck, and they're stuck in, <laughs> inside, and ride on that. And he, he had bells on these horses, and sometimes after school he'd come by and, and we'd all jump on. Was that neat though? I mean, the things we did, you know. When did you get electricity in your house? Uh, probably, see I was born in 37, I think they had, we, we only had electricity downstairs because it was too expensive to put it upstairs. <laughs> we had ca ca kerosene lanterns, you know, yep. that was. Yep. So. Uh, five miles nor uh, north of Austin, uh, Labar Country School, uh, District 76. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it, we actually got a good education. I, I know uh, a number of kids in that school. Then, then we had a consolidation after I left, then consolidation came in, which New Prague I heard about all that went through. We all went through that. But those are good experiences, but a number of the kids that I went to school with ended up going to college. And so it was, we weren't all dumb country punkers. <laughs> One of the things that through my oral discussions and interviews and talking to people was the fact that many of the young children attending schools uh, only spoke the native language that their forebears spoke. So there are many bo children of Bohemian background that only spoke Bohemian. And when they got to school, in my conversation, some were very regretful of that. They had a very difficult time. The teacher noted that in their records, that the student had a difficulty overcoming the language barrier, and then some did not. This was also common in the German community in Union Hill. Now, we have a Union Hill graduate here. Mm -hmm. can, can you, can, did you go, you went to a one-room schoolhouse too? It, it was a two-room schoolhouse. We had the little room and the big room, First, second, and third grade were in the little room. Fourth, fifth, and sixth in the big room. And I went through fifth grade and, and then it was closed and we went to New Prague. And the teachers, he meant, you mentioned Betty Stika. Yep. I first had uh, Marty Weldon in the little room. Ida Welter taught in the big room. And then I don't know why Marty left or what happened, but then Betty Stika came. They, they moved teachers around in the district for a while there. Yeah. A lot of these women, when I started teaching in 65, I taught in the elementary school. And at that time, there were eight elementary teachers in our district teaching in that 1900 building. Mm -hmm. And they had normal education. Mm -hmm. So in the process, the first year years, they had to go back to Mankato to get a four year another two years of it. And you talked of, about the Germans. I have a distinct memory of Giesenbroi. It was Werner Giesen. <laughs> Werner Giesen would come over. They lived by the ballpark and play with me. And we had this little glider. I, I can't recall how many years older than I he is, maybe four. But Werner would come over. And I can just see my mom sitting on the back steps. Werner would come over, and he'd be talking to me in German. And then I would look at my mother and she would tell me what Werner said because they only spoke German at their house. And, and one other thing that I'll always remember, oh, and I have a question. I always remember, I must have been in first grade. Um, I believe his name was Father Marcelin. It came up in the little room, Armella Conley from St. Thomas now Armella Holden, Armella Connolly was brought a butter churn and she was showing us how to churn butter and the priest came up and was crying and said, please kneel and say a prayer. Well, it was President Kennedy. He said, the president's been shot. And then we must have all, I'm not sure if we watched on TV after, but you know, I remember that moment. Never yeah. 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 You had a question? Oh, my question was this. Someone had asked me a while back, and you mentioned all the different um, religions you had at your school, George. At Union Hill, we went, of course, the church was right there, so maybe that's why. We went to Mass every day. And, like, I know for a fact that we were all, in my class, there were. Uh, there were five girls and seven boys. But we had one gal who moved west of Union Hill, and maybe she was Lutheran, but she wasn't Catholic. 
but wasn't this a public school? It was, but it never was a Catholic school, so people asked me, why did you go to Mass every day if it wasn't a Catholic school? Was it because we were all Catholic, or? Well, it's just to understand. I, Mike Bean was the counselor in New Prague, and maybe some of you remember Mike Bean. When he was hired, it was hired, he was hired two years, I think, before I was hired, and he, the superintendent took him over to see Monier, Monsignor Popelka at the Catholic Church before they hired him. So there was this, con there was this blending of, of the, uh, in the community, it was an understanding he wanted uh, Mike to be a good high stand. He was the first counselor in New Prague. And so there was this, this common thing that was accepted. Uh, and I know I was asked what religion I was before I was hired. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> sure. and I said Lutheran, and his eyes kind of popped. <laughs> okay. uh, David, you went. Did you speak Bohemian or did you English speak Bohemian? Yes, I, I was. That was my first language, it was Czech. So when I started country school in District 62 over the Toledo Township, Mrs. Mrs. Bezik, Sylvia Bezik was the teacher. And I think she taught at St. Wentz for a while too, if I remember right, mm -hmm. later on in her career. But um, after my first grade, it would have been about 40, 1946, they closed the school. So the, my parents sent me to St. Wentz. Well, guess what? The nuns didn't speak Czech. <laughs> I, I became a bilingual. <laughs> Do any of you all others here this evening have something to share, a recollection or a story from yourself, your experiences, or a family member that you'd like to bring forward at this time? Our teacher said way back when, with the Germans, they married for butter and worst. <laughs> That's what she said, and she was Irish, so she couldn't help it. Say, hey Dan. Yes. Uh, about that schoolhouse there, uh, tell us what happened between the time that uh, you quit school there and it got moved. Well, what happened was uh, it was used for 4-H for a number of years, and then it was just kind of vacant. No, and it, we played in it. All she the played. Time. See, I, 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 I wasn't living there then. Yeah. I, I think we need to hear from this young lady here. And I was saying, she, yeah, we. She happens to be Denny Holleran's granddaughter. Yes, I am number three of six. The youngest two, though, were my. They came along later. So the oldest four, we have great memories of being in there, having my grandparents come over with us. We would pretend we were on Little House in the Prairie all the time and sit in the desks and our friends would want to come over all the time to uh, play with us. One of them being your niece, Sarah Hansel. Um, but uh, yeah, we have great memories and um, was sad to see it go, but happy as well because it, it was preserved. It wouldn't have been um, otherwise. So yeah, it also became kind of a site for vandalism too. We had a lot of people yeah. um, Sheriff was out quite often. And the door, the door was usually open, or you yeah. could open it easily. That's I, when I got my job. That's where I, I would sit there in solitude and study, and put stuff on the board. So it, to me, it was just like old home week. So. Uh, but used for storage for eight or a grand? I don't believe so. No, I, I, don't, I don't think they did. And it, and, and before it got too bad, uh, then it was moved to Pioneer Power, and 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 restored, but. As the school says, we need your help. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to add? I have to say. Yes. I obviously did not go to a one-room schoolhouse, but when I was in college, we did something for a class called a life review, and I did it on my grandmother, um, one of the Polish people that you referred to that grew up near uh, Lexington. And so she was born in 1925, so she was in school in the 30s in a one-room schoolhouse. And when I was talking with her about her time in school, there was two things that stuck out to me that she discussed. And one of them, she said, was her frustration that all the boys got to play baseball and she didn't because she wore a dress. And she said, it just wasn't fair that they got to play and I had to wear a dress. And there was also something which I'm not real familiar with, but maybe you guys are, but something called sorghum. And she said her lunch every day was a sorghum sandwich. 
And I said, well, what? what's sorghum? Never even heard of it. And she said it was like a cane type thing that you grew. It's a twist. It's a between molasses and maple syrup, something. It's a syrup. And she said that was her sandwich every day that she ate for school. And she said, but the kids that had money had peanut butter. And she said if there was a kid in class that opened their lunchbox and they had peanut butter, she said it filled the room. She said you could smell peanut butter through the whole schoolroom. And I just thought it was just so interesting to me because something that we take for granted today that we think is a simple nothing meal was something that filled her was high cuisine back in the 30s and even the 40s when she was in school. So I said I'd share those bits about my grandmother who's been gone now for 10, 15 and years. And you wanted so. to find out how you could get that peanut butter. Yeah. Just be given a bite. <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> uh, well, who, one thing that we did, we had hot lunch, but because we had this big uh, stove of, that she had to put wood in, the teacher, or coal. And then about 11 o'clock, we had a big, uh, remember those little blue, things you use heat water in, mm -hmm. the water would be about this high, and you'd bring your hot lunch uh, in a pint jar, a half pint jar, and all those kids would put them in there, and so we'd have hot lunch. And she'd watch it so it wouldn't boil it again. Isn't that neat? I mean, no microwaves back then. And, always, and you had to be sure to get that jar, your jar home with a lid. Oh, it, yeah. If it got broken, you didn't, you know how it was, those jars you read. But it's interesting, we had hot lunch. I thought that was really nice. Yeah. Ma would say, where's that lid? <laughs> you left it again, didn't you? <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to add? We're, uh, we're open for discussion, experiences. They're all good, though. Dennis, you have anything you want to close with? Well, I want to just uh, comment on the fact that the Independent School District 721 and Frank School District helped to me in, in us to uh, introduce the township maps that are on display this evening and the reproduction of the photographs through the Sewell or the New Prague Times office. It, it does cost money to put these exhibits on. And um, we uh, certainly appreciate their help in doing so. They found uh, some uh, money someplace and helped us. They're not supposed to do private or community things such as this, but they and, uh, uh, found it somewhere and, and, uh, and helped me with this. So very much appreciative, appreciate it. The collection of township maps and the photographs will enter the collection of the New Prague Times. And one last thing. Library, you have this wonderful book by Tom Elker called "They Called Me Teacher," and it's just—it's a great book to just sit down and page through because it does have stories um, uh, in it. Uh, from in talking about some of the New Prague area citizens who did teach in one of the schoolhouses and those that attended, so I draw attention to that because it's local history, and that's what we're all about. Dan, Dan, did you want to mention what you have on your table? Oh, it's, it, it's teachers uh, that worked at some of the schools. I have a map of Leeser County and where things were. I was starting to collect it earlier, so it's all over there. And it's phenomenal, the teachers. And as you look, and this is only 1945, but a lot of them you knew. A lot of them were grandmas, aunts, whatever. I got to play you one song in closing. <laughs> You're gonna like this. Just twist and shout. There's a tear in my eye. I want to be one, but it never should be done. Now we were Irish, but the Polish lived right on the road, and they had a lot of kids. There were retkas and meggers and everybody. <laughs>